are gathered around the fireplace for a new story. And tonight we're going to explore the history of colors. What is it about exactly? Of course colors don't change. And our ancestors knew the same colors as we do. They saw them in nature, mostly. Whereas our world is full of artificially colored items, metals, plastics, fabrics. There is an abundance of dyes and colors around us nowadays. In various surveys conducted around the world, blue appears as the favorite color of a majority. Up to 50% of the population followed by green, red, and purple. I made a simple survey on my channel before releasing this story. And out of 8,000 respondents, the ranking of favorite colors is the same. Blue, followed by green and red. It's hard to know how our ancestors would have responded the same question a century ago or a thousand years ago. There's no way to know. The appeal of colors may be cultural for a part, but from one country to the next, the ranking is not that different. So maybe there's also something biological to it, or it has something to see with the feelings and experiences we attach to colors as we experience life and as we grow up. There are not many negative things or objects associated with blue or green, for example, and that may explain the preference. There are various theories, but no certainties about the reasons why some colors are preferred to others. And we don't know how these preferences evolve over time. It's not even sure colors were always perceived and classified as we do. For example, to the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, all the various shades that we collectively call blue were not a single color. To them, dark and light blues were entirely different hues. But what we can approach, and this is what we will explore in this story, is how the significance of colors, their symbolism, the status attached to them, their presence in art and crafts has evolved along the centuries. Colors were very important in many ancient cultures, and there was a strict code about them that was enforced. Some of them could be prohibited or their use limited to a certain group of people. We're going to see that this is not a random phenomenon, or one that is separated from material constraints. The rarity of pigments in specific regions of the world, religions, political events, the geography, the development of art, all of these contributed to shape the taste in colors and uh, the significance attached to them. So we have a lot to discuss tonight. And for you to relax and just focus on the story, the fireplace sounds are now going to fade away. But they will be back later to lull you to sleep after we finish the story. Feel free to close your eyes anytime and fall asleep. There are timestamps in the first command to help you resume the story later. And you may also download this video in HD and many others or the audio tracks on my Patreon page. There is a link in the description. We're going to begin our journey with the color blue. Blue 
blue is like the king of colors nowadays. As indicated in the introduction, surveys in many countries put this color since the beginning of the 20th century as the favorite color of almost half the population. We don't know whether or not it was already the case several centuries ago, but if we go back to ancient times, blue was much less common in items than it has become. Of course the color blue is unavoidable. It is the color of the sky, generally of seas and lakes. But when you think about it, it is much less common in plants, animals, and all the raw materials that our ancestors relied on to make objects and art. Metals, wood, stones, place. The color blue is absent from cave art, and it remained uncommon in man-made objects until late in the antiquity. With the exception of ancient Egypt, it seems the color blue was not particularly prestigious or sought after during the antiquity, at least compared with colors like red, purple, white or black. An example of ancient civilization that did not care much for blue is ancient Greece. It is little known, but the Greeks classified colors by how light or dark they were, rather than by the hue. The Greek word for dark blue, for example, kianeos, could mean dark blue or dark green, brown, black and the word for light blue, glaucos, could also indicate grey or light green or yellow. In their vision there was no way dark and light blue could be the same color. And contrary to colors like red, ochre or purple, it was hard to find good pigments in nature. The minerals were limited to lapis lazuli, which was rare and precious, or azurite, which is a copper mineral, also hard to find. And when it came to dyes for textiles, they were discovered later in the antiquity. There were two plants, mainly. In Europe, woad, a plant native to the steppe of Central Asia and the Caucasus which then expanded to the south and west of Europe, where it was cultivated as a source of blue dye. The leaves of wood provide a, a blue dye that was the primary source for this color in Europe, from the Neolithic to the end of the Middle Ages. It was cultivated especially in Germany, in England and in France. Sometimes entire cities became prosperous along the centuries thanks to it. For example, the city of Toulouse in the southwest of France. There are still mansions in this city that were built several centuries ago by the owners of this dyeing industry. But even long before that, wood was used by the Celts, especially in Britain where the Romans noted that some tribes covered their bodies and face in blue. Actually, the Picts, an ancient people from the north of Great Britain, are called the Picts from Latin Picti, meaning the painted ones. And wood provided a relatively light blue, not the intense blue that another plant, indigo, could give. We'll talk about indigo in a minute, because it became one of the most important dyes in the world for centuries in the modern period. So the Romans knew a blue dye, but in clothing this color was associated with the working class, mainly. Color codes were enforced quite strictly in Rome. Higher classes used white and red, 
and the most prestigious of all colors was purple, which came from a rare and precious kind of dye. It was a symbol of power. Emperors wore it. Blue clothing, on the other hand, was relatively basic. So Europe and most of the Mediterranean world used wood as a, a dye for textiles. But at the same time, in Asia, the source of blue dye was indigo. It was also independently discovered in South America. Fabrics that are 6,000 years old, dyed with indigo, were discovered in Peru. Indigo is not a single plant. It is the name given to the dye itself, and different plants produce it including wood, but wood doesn't have the concentration necessary to produce deep blue, contrary to other plants from the genus Indigofera, which naturally grow in tropical and subtropical regions of the world. These plants were abandoned in India, and India exported blue indigo dye and dyed textiles several thousand years ago already. For thousands of years, it was the major center for its production in the world. And from India, indigo made its way to Mesopotamia, Egypt, China, the Mediterranean Sea. It was known by the Greeks and the Romans and was considered a luxury product. It is no coincidence if indigo sounds like India. The Greeks called it indicon, meaning Indian, and the Romans latinized the word to indicum, which uh, then passed to uh, Italian and eventually to other European languages, giving indigo in Spanish, French or English. Indigo dyes were also used in Africa for centuries, especially in West Africa. There was a long textile tradition in which clothes dyed with indigo were a symbol of wealth among many people, including the Yoruba of Nigeria, the Mandarin cow of Mali, the Hausa or the Tuareg nomads in the Sahara. On many counts, indigo was better than wood. It gave a more intense blue. It was also more cost-effective. It arrived from India at a very high cost until the end of the Middle Ages and was a luxury product. But once a direct connection by the seas was established between India and Europe by navigators in the 16th century, and many intermediaries disappeared, the price on European markets dropped. And then indigo producing plants were among the colonial crops that Europeans introduced and developed in America. Indigo thrived in the Caribbean, among other products like tobacco, sugar, coffee, cocoa, cotton, and it threatened to destroy the centuries-old wood industry in Europe. Some countries, like Germany and France, initially banned it to protect their industry, but it didn't last, and wood-based dyes declined to the point of becoming marginal. Indigo was transported in blocks of an intense deep blue color that could be diluted to dye textiles or make paint, and it lasted well into the 19th century when synthetic blue dyes replaced it. We'll come back to that. Apart from plants, the other source of blue pigment in the ancient world was minerals like lapis lazuli. The only ancient civilization with evidence of a high status given to the color blue was Egypt. In Egypt, blue was associated with divinity and good luck, 
and lapis lazuli being rare and very expensive, it came from Afghanistan. It was used in precious jewelry, but it wasn't the only kind of blue available to make items. Beginning in the 3rd century BC, ancient Egyptians started to produce a blue pigment called Egyptian blue that they invented. It was a mix of various minerals like silica, there was also lime and copper that they heated and the resulting material could be ground. It is believed to be the first synthetic pigment ever created. This Egyptian blue was used to paint wood, papyrus, to create frescoes, and also to color glass and make blue faience beads or blue inlays inside vases, for example. The Romans knew this artificial pigment and they used it. But after the decline of the Roman Empire, the recipe was lost and rediscovered only recently. I told you that blue remained a relatively minor color for the Greeks and the Romans. But the one culture where it became much more important in the centuries following the fall of the Western Roman Empire was in Islamic countries. Islamic architects and decorators used a lot of blue tiles to cover countless palaces and mosques from the south of Spain to Central Asia. Many of them still exist today and their facades with geometric patterns or floral details have stood the test of time very well. One appeal of the color blue in monumental architecture is that it is not common in nature, out of the sky and the sea. So reproducing such colors that evoke the heavens in a building indicated something sacred or at least remarkable. But still, blue was not the favorite color in the Islamic world. Green and white were. We'll come back to that later in this story. But green was said to be the Prophet's favorite color. And for cultures that developed from regions with a lot of deserts, it is understandable that green, meaning plants, water, a welcoming place, life, became the favorite color. It depended on the places and times, but sometimes blue was a, a color only worn by Christian and uh, Jewish minorities who lived inside Muslim countries, whereas green and white were limited to Muslims. In Christian countries, it is also through architecture that the status of the color blue began to change. And this happened with the development of Gothic architecture and stained glass. Until the 12th century, blue played a minor role. Its status had remained unchanged since the times of Rome, and only poor people would wear it. Maybe they liked the color blue better, but in society, the color of prestige, power, nobility, faith was red. We'll come back to that later. Until the 12th century, because in the 12th century, the status of the color blue began to change. And it all started around 1130 with the Gothic Revolution in religious architecture. And with this revolution, the appearance of large windows in churches and cathedrals that were decorated with stained glass. To the people who saw these first large stained glass works, it was absolutely wonderful. This type of colored light was oh inspiring like nothing they had even dreamt of before. And stained glass windows were often colored with cobalt, which gave blue glass. 
together with a bit of red, it filled the church with a, a bluish violet light that seemed completely otherworldly. This started in the region of Paris, initially at the Saint-Denis Basilica, then at the Saint-Chapelle in the center of Paris, and from the region of Paris it spread to many Gothic works, including, for example, the Cathedral of Chartres, a town south of Paris that still has blue stained glass from the early period of Gothic. It took decades, but the adoption of the Gothic style in Western Europe really modified the perception of the color blue. Thanks to its association with the sacred, peace and serenity, it became much more desirable and more prestigious for the first time in centuries. About at the same time, another factor of a religious and artistic nature that changed the status of the color blue was the veneration of the Virgin Mary and the colors used to paint her clothes. In the 12th century, the Roman Catholic Church instructed painters to represent Mary with the most expensive pigment that arrived in Europe, ultramarine, which was basically ground and refined lapis lazuli. Using lapis lazuli as a pigment was not new. The Egyptians or the Mesopotamians did it thousands of years earlier, but in medieval Europe, it was more expensive than ever. It came from Afghanistan, traveling along the Silk Road, and arrived in Italy via Venice or Genoa at a cost higher than gold. The one new thing with ultramarine is that the lapis lazuli powder was extremely refined. Impurities were eliminated through a long process and this gave a very rich and deep blue that no other pigment could compete with. It didn't take long before kings and princes in Europe also adopted blue because it was expensive, exclusive and now prestigious. The first kings to dress in blue and incorporate blue into their coat of arms were the kings of France especially Louis IX, also known as Saint Louis. The coat of arms of kings of France became a blue shield with golden fleur-de-lis. The fleur-de-lis is a type of iris. In just a few decades, blue spread in royal clothing and symbols in all of Europe, and it became associated with wealth and power. Blue also became the king of colors in painting, and its shades changed with technical evolutions. In the Middle Ages, a lot of painting was made with tempera. Tempera is a fast-drying kind of paint, made of pigments and a binder, egg yolk generally. It can dissolve in water. During the Renaissance, oil painting started to replace it on a large scale, at least for the most prestigious paintings. But oil painting changed the way the colors looked on canvas and how they were used. Colors tend to be shinier and darker. The ultramarine pigment, for example, in oil painting tended to be very dark, almost black. And for this reason, artists like Raphael started to add white to it. In the late Middle Ages, the clothes of the Virgin Mary were of a vivid blue or dark blue, and they became sky blue. This sky blue color turned into a tradition and even religious paintings from the 19th century kept using it to depict Mary 
even though the pigment was no longer ultramarine. Another luxury item in which blue was highly sought after from the Middle Ages became ceramics, Chinese porcelain especially. For centuries, China had a, a monopoly on porcelain, having discovered the recipe that gave it a perfectly white and slightly transparent aspect. In comparison, ceramics from other parts of the world looked much thicker and more basic, less refined. Chinese craftsmen developed various colors to ornate porcelain objects. It couldn't be done with regular paint because the, the items had to be heated at high temperature. In the 9th century, they started using cobalt salts to manufacture blue and white porcelain. And later, in the Middle Ages, these pieces began to be exported to Europe via the Silk Road. For centuries, Europeans tried to imitate that kind of white and blue porcelain. There were attempts in England, in France, in the Low Countries, in Russia. Maybe one of the most successful was Delft porcelain, from the city of Delft in the Netherlands. But it is only in the 18th century that the secret was discovered and the quality of European porcelain started to come close to the Chinese production. By the 15th, 16th centuries, the color blue had completely lost its ancient association with the working class, and it was used by everyone in clothing, from peasants to kings. Indigo replaced wood as the source of dye for textile, making the color blue relatively cheap and very resistant too. And now that it was associated with authority, and at the same time relatively affordable, it spread to many new uses. For example, military uniforms. Blue became the color of foot soldiers and sailors in many countries. Maybe for a part because of its popularity, it was subverted by revolutionary armies at the end of the 18th century. After the outbreak of the American Revolution, it became in 1779 the official color of the uniform, and it went on in the US Army until 1902. The dress uniform is still blue today. French revolutionaries also adopted blue as opposed to white for the French royalists and the Austrians, who were the main opponents at the beginning of the French Revolution. And Napoleon kept blue as the uniform color for his armies, and it was abandoned in France only in 1915 because it was too visible on the battlefields. But after the parenthesis of revolutions, blue became increasingly the color of government and authority in the 19th century. And to a large extent it still is. It is the go-to color for policemen and uh, other public servants, for school uniforms too. And still the reason was the uh, symbol attached to this color plus the cost. The rise of indigo had turned it into the most produced kind of dye around the world. The success of indigo is the reason why blue jeans are blue. They are made of denim, which is a cotton textile. Blue jeans became immensely popular in America, starting in the last quarter of the 19th century. And they even turned into a symbol of the US. But the textile itself, denim, was invented in Europe. Denim derives from Serge de Nîmes. Serge, serge is a textile, 
and Nîmes is a city in the southeast of France. It was produced in various places, but it was adapted to make pants in the US starting in the 1870s. And it makes sense because cotton and indigo were major products of America's agriculture back then. Actually, the word jeans also comes from French. The port of Genoa, Italy, is called Gênes in French, which gave jeans in an anglicized form. The absolute peak for the indigo industry was in the 19th century, because after eliminating other blue dyes, indigo itself became victim of a new, more affordable product, synthetic indigo. The substitute was discovered in Germany in 1878, and it gradually replaced natural indigo, which collapsed completely in two to three decades. And uh, the trade of natural indigo from India and the West Indies disappeared completely in the 1920s. Nowadays, almost all blue clothing is dyed with a synthetic dye called the indanthrone blue. All the dyes are used only for very small scale productions like artisanal crafts or for the restoration of all the textiles. Ultramarine in painting, that is to say ground and refined lapis lazuli, also disappeared and was replaced with new pigments, especially Prussian blue, which also gave a, a vivid deep blue for a fraction of the cost. This Prussian blue is the blue you see in Impressionist paintings or Japanese prints. It was one of the first Western products to be imported in Japan. Nowadays we are probably surrounded by more blue man-made objects than at any time in human history. Blue has completely lost its ancient association with the lower social classes, and it tends to be associated by a majority of people with feelings like serenity, liberty, and it can sound contradictory but authority too. Blue seems to suggest to the majority of people a type of authority that is legitimate and not too invasive. It remains heavily used by governments. The old reason of the cheap cost and availability of indigo no longer exists, in fact. At this point, the use of blue in law enforcement or for formal military uniforms is a mix of tradition, with maybe a bit of calculation. Governments use the positive feelings attached to this color in the, the population. Now let's change color and talk about red, which competes with green as the second favorite color around the world. The rise of blue took thousands of years, and the reason for that was the limited number of natural pigments. Red never had this problem, and was one of the first colors used by humanity. And like blue, it was quickly invested with a lot of symbolism. The earliest source of red was probably ochre. Ochre is a type of clay that can range in color from yellow to brown, depending on its exact composition. When there is enough iron oxide, rust, it is red. And the range of colors given by ochre is actually the one we associate with cave art, together with black, which was obtained with charcoal most of the time. 
there is evidence that late Stone Age people, more than 40,000 years ago, already scrapped and ground ochre to get a red powder that they might have used to paint and color their bodies. Apart from ochre, another natural source of red is hematite, an iron oxide which is widespread in rocks and soils. The sources of red pigments were not only minerals. It seems it started later, in the Neolithic period, but a red dye was also created by drying and crushing small insects, insects like kermes and cochineal. These insects live on the roots and stems of different plants, and they contain pigments of a very vivid red in various shades like vermilo or carmine. This type of pigments have been discovered in sites from the Neolithic period, and overall red dyes and paints were already available all around the world during the antiquity. And finally, there were plant-based dyes, especially the root of a plant called rubia, or madder, that's the same thing, that was used to dye fabrics around the Mediterranean, India and China. Red was an important color in all ancient civilizations, but with a different meaning, and also an ambivalent one, maybe because it was the color of blood. In ancient Egypt, it was associated with health, life and victory. Egyptian women used red to color their nails and hair, and ochre powder to redden their cheeks and lips. But it was also the color of heat and destruction, and there are ancient Egyptian prayers asking for protection against everything evil and red. Red was also used as a dye for clothes in Egypt, India, China, and in all this culture it was one of the most frequent colors in man-made objects, in clothes, painted walls, pottery, lacquerware. In China, the color red became increasingly positive over time. It was associated with luck and prosperity. The gates and walls of palaces were painted red, and to this day, the color dominates in Chinese celebrations. Red also played an important role in Chinese philosophy. According to it, there were five elements, and each of them had a color. Metal, wood, water, fire, and earth. Red was the color of fire. During several dynasties, when a new emperor rose to the throne, his fortune tellers would tell him what color would bring the most success to his reign. And until the Ming dynasty, that is to say the early modern period, red was a noble color. On the other side of the planet, in Mesoamerica, red was probably the most used color in architecture. The Maya painted their pyramids and palaces red. We don't always know to what extent and how it was understood, but in all Mesoamerican civilizations, human blood and human sacrifices were a major aspect of religion and of their belief systems in general. So obviously the color red was given a particular attention it was sacred, and the one color that could please the gods and ensure the continuation of the world. To the Romans, red occupied the status of blue in the modern period. It was maybe the most important color, 
in any case the one that represented power, authority, the army, victory. Roman soldiers wore red tunics and officers a cloak that could rain from crimson to purple. When a Roman general received a triumph, he had his entire body painted red. The Romans also developed a new pigment for painting called vermilion. It was a vivid red that came from the mineral cinnabar. They had mines of cinnabar in Spain, from which it was exported to Italy and the rest of the Roman Empire. This pigment was highly resilient. Twenty centuries later, the frescoes painted in Roman villas, like in Pompeii, are still bright and colorful. And once again, economic aspects had their importance. The most expensive and rarest kind of dye in the Roman antiquity was purple, a dye obtained from a shell that gave a reddish purple color. It became the color of emperors and its use was forbidden to the common folk to protect the color code that reflected distinction between social classes. The symbolism attached to red did not disappear with the Western Roman Empire, as its successors claimed its heritage, and the Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantium, maintained the same hierarchy of colors that placed red on top, the color of emperors and power. And so did the new princes of Europe, and the Catholic Church too until blue became the new red in the 12th, 13th centuries. But before that, European kings had red as their favorite color. And red was everywhere in clothing in the Middle Ages, very popular color. But not everyone wore the same red. Red dye for ordinary people was made with rubia, this plant I mentioned before, that was used as a red dye for thousands of years. The color it gave was more brick red and it faded easily in the sun or during washing. So common folks could not afford a bright red color. Only the wealthy and the aristocrats could wear scarlet red dyed with insects. Insects like Kermes contained carminic acid, a compound that gave this vivid red and a very resilient color. Like for blue dyes, an entire industry developed around this high-end red. The insects were quite abundant in Europe and around the Mediterranean Sea, but the process to create a bright scarlet was long and complicated. They had to be gathered, dried, crushed, and then boiled with other ingredients. Makers of scarlet dye protected their secrets fiercely. But like the producers of blue dye based on the woad plant, who disappeared when indigo reached Europe, the producers of scarlet dye based on kermes were replaced with another find produced by the exploration of the world. This time not from India, but from America. When the army of Hernan Cortes conquered the Aztecs in Mexico, they discovered not only silver and gold, but another insect, the cochineal. It produced a red dye like Kermes and it is related to it, but it could be harvested more frequently. It was stronger, and it produced a brighter red than the best Kermes. On top of that, it worked very well on luxury textiles like silk. The first shipments of cochineal were sent to Europe in the years 1520, and it produced
progressively replaced other pigments for luxury dyeing and also served as a pigment for fine painting. The reds in the works of painters like Rembrandt, Vermeer, Velasquez or Tintoretto came from cochineal. Like in ancient times, red in the arts, especially vivid red, kept its association with passion, war, violence sometimes. It was seen and remains seen as intense, but due to the rise of blue from the 12th century, red progressively lost its association with royalty and power, with the exception of a few countries like England. However, in the late 18th century, it started to gain a new political and symbolic meaning. And it all started during the French Revolution. There were various parties fighting for influence between the storming of the Bastille in 1789 and the rise of Napoleon ten years later. The mainstream revolutionaries in the early stages of the revolution intended to create a constitutional monarchy and they adopted blue, as I said earlier, for a part because it had been the colors of the American revolutionaries, and also as opposed to the white flag of the royalists. But more radical parties and politicians, from what we would call the far left nowadays, adopted a red flag. Why red? Of course there was this intensity and the idea of war attached to it, but it was also the color of the flags hoisted by the government to declare a state of emergency or a siege. It meant alert, and they voluntarily made these color dares to express how radical they were and to call for action. To recognize themselves, Many supporters of this hard left party wore the red Frisian cap, which was modeled after the caps that freed slaves wore in ancient Rome. For a short period of time, especially with the figure of Robespierre, the revolution turned more popular, or as we would say today, more leftist, until the radical left parties and politicians were sidelined or eliminated. It didn't last long, but symbolically it turned red into a politicized color, the color that a new political and social movement would adopt in the 19th century, socialism. In 1848 there was another revolution in France that replaced the monarchy with a new republic, and the protesters mainly Parisian workers, used the red flag again as a, a direct reference to the revolution of the late 18th century. There were various uprisings across Europe in 1848 against monarchies, and they started using red flags too. And 22 years later, the red flag reappeared in the Paris Commune. In 1870, the city of Paris revolted for two months as the regime of Napoleon III, the Second Empire, was collapsing. Ultimately, the revolt was crushed, but it remained the source of inspiration for all the left-wing revolutionaries across Europe as a model of what a popular insurrection could look like. At the time, Paris and its surroundings were already very industrialized, and an industrial working class had appeared. So this seemed to fit quite well into Marx's predictions and the model of a working class insurrection. But the sociology remained very different in the rest of France. There were small movements in big cities, but the rest of the country just didn't follow the insurrection. 
So the French army besieged and then crushed the Paris Commune. But after this episode, the red flag became the symbol of the socialist movement and was claimed by uh, Marxist parties. It became the color of communist countries in the 20th century, from China to Eastern Europe. Actually, with the notable exception of the USA, red traditionally is associated with the left all around the world, and blue with the right, the conservatives. In the US, blue is the color of the Democrats, and red the Republicans. This color scheme has uh, extended to red states, predominantly conservative, and blue states, more liberals. But the switch in color is very, very recent, actually. Until the 1980s, Democrats were often represented by red and Republicans by blue. But in the 1980s and 1990s, newspapers and television networks began to alternate colors following different logics. And it is only after the 2000 election that major media outlets began conforming to the same color scheme, an inverted one. It has spread so much now, and uh, even entered political language, that it is probably not going to change anytime soon. But in that respect, the uh, USA is an exception. Returning to dyes, cochineal and plants like madder for cheaper dyes had become industries of their own until the 19th century, when, exactly like for indigo, they became victims of technical progress. The organic compound, alizarin, that gave the red color was discovered and synthesized. It could be produced from coal tar, very cheap raw material. The new synthetic dye was not only cheaper, it was also better, much more lasting. In a matter of years, import of cochineal from Latin America and the plantation of madder in Europe completely disappeared. Red remains an ambivalent color nowadays. It is still politically charged, but beyond that, it is associated with intensity. It may represent courage and sacrifice. The modern example is the red poppy flower worn on Remembrance Day in Commonwealth countries. It is also the color of love, of happiness and celebration. It is the color most frequently associated with Christmas. Official receptions, red carpets, seats in opera houses. And at the same time it may represent anger, aggression or danger. It is the traditional color of warning signs. And this link with violence or danger is very ancient. I told you earlier that red flags could signal a state of emergency in 18th century France, but even earlier, in the Middle Ages or on pirate ships, red flags indicated mortal warfare, where the losers would be executed instead of being taken prisoners. In Western countries with a Christian tradition, there may be a religious dimension to it. The church adopted red as a symbol of authority, something it inherited from Rome. The cardinals are dressed in red every time there is an official ceremony. They continue with the tradition of the Roman purple. But Christian theology also associated the color with sin, sexual passion, and the devil. In religious iconography and in popular culture, Satan or demons are most of the time black or red. So maybe more than any other color, red attracts a lot of conflicting interpretations from 
prostitution to uh, official ceremonies, from danger to uh, good health, from love to aggression. What they all have in common is intensity. But for most people, red is not perceived as a relaxing color. To conclude our exploration, we're going to talk about one last favorite, green. Green was not an easy color to reproduce in prehistoric times. It could have been obtained by mixing blue and yellow pigments, but as we have seen before, blue pigments were also hard to find. So, we have no known trace of green man-made pigments before the antiquity. But green is very present in nature because of chlorophyll, and this is the color we spontaneously associate with plants, vegetation in general. Its positive perception probably comes from this. The appeal of green was probably even stronger than it is today to the first agrarian societies, living a sedentary life based on agriculture. It meant literally life, growth or rebirth. And this is the traditional association we find in ancient societies. The Egyptians found the green pigment in malachite, a semi-precious stone that was ground for painting. And when it came to textiles, they would color the fabrics twice, first with saffron that gave it a yellow color, and then with the woad plant which produced a blue dye as we've seen before. The hieroglyph for green represented a, a growing papyrus, which shows well the association of the color with regeneration and life to them. Like for blue, the Greeks showed little interest in green. It is almost absent from their art, and they didn't have the same uh, categories of colors, if you remember. Blue and green were not always distinguished from one another and they could be given the same name based on how light or dark they were. Democritus, a Greek philosopher, described two different colors according to him that we would name green nowadays. Pale and dark green were entirely different to him. The Romans showed more appreciation for green in painting, in mosaics or glassware, but it was like blue, a relatively secondary color in their production of art and crafts. In the color code of the European Middle Ages, green was an intermediate in an intermediate position. As we have seen, red dominated for the nobility. Peasants would wear blue, brown or grey, and green was mostly the color of a small urban upper middle class. The gentry, that is to say lesser aristocrats, merchants, bankers would wear green, and they would wear this color as a sign of distinction. Green dyes were relatively poor and gave a brownish kind of green, so for fine clothes the textile would be dyed twice, in yellow and then in blue. But for painters there were more options of pigments. There was malachite and also an artificial pigment called verdigris made by soaking copper in fermenting wine. The one culture in the world where green dominated was uh, Islam in Islamic countries. Green is the traditional color of Islam 
and it appears even nowadays on most flags of predominantly Muslim countries. According to tradition, the robe and the banner of the Prophet Muhammad were green, and Islam being born in a rather desertic region of the world where vegetation and a vivid green indicated the presence of water and food, a shelter. It is not surprising that the color acquired this very positive significance. Also by tradition in Muslim countries, this Islamic green is said to be the color of paradise. Apart from Islam, Green can have a religious significance in some Christian countries too. It may be used by Roman Catholic and part of the Protestant clergy during some periods of the year when there is no particular celebration approaching. These periods are called ordinary time. But it is also a color of Christmas together with red and this may be inherited from pre-Christian times when evergreens were worshipped because they had the ability to maintain their green color all around the year, including through the winter season. The first affordable pigments for painting and the first green dyes that could give a good vivid green color appeared quite recently in the 18th and 19th centuries, accompanying the rise of modern chemistry. Green nowadays is a fairly popular color, and like blue it faces very little rejection. There are colors like brown, yellow, orange, or even red that are polarizing. But green isn't and the association with nature, especially in urbanized societies where the daily contact with nature is limited, makes it appealing. In this sense, maybe green is going to be the new blue. As you know, it has also started to become politicized as a color. Environmentalists and parties in favor of ecology adopted it. They are generally considered to be on the left, but the color green for them is at the same time a way to represent their commitment to the environment and to distance themselves from a more traditional left represented by the color red. There would be much more to say about colors but we have reached the end of our exploration journey. On many counts it was superficial, but I hope it motivates you to learn more, be it about symbolism, pigments, the history of art, or even psychology. The sweet sound of the fireplace is now going to return and lull you to sleep. And I'll talk to you soon about a different story. Sweet dreams. Au revoir.